Hello everyone, I'm your host, Mr. Lindley. Today, work and energy. Two topics that are insanely important and one would say foundational to a lot of physics. And energy being something that's really important in many fields, including sports. Thanks, Mr. Lindley. Energy. Do our athletes come out with a lot of potential? Do they have enough kinetic energy to get themselves through these matches. Some people say they're gonna really have to put in the FD. I have also heard people say that if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. I'm waiting for that day when I start working. Back to you. What a lovely sentiment. For the details on this interesting topic, we head to the classroom with Mr. Lindley. Hey, thanks, and we're here, you know? What, what, a, what an energetic topic we got going on today. Energy, let's, uh, let's get those equations up. There's so many of them, what? Where do we start with, with a unit like this? And if I had to officially define this, we'd probably call it work and energy, even though energy is really the foundational thing, but, you know, but what is work? Is it a very popular pop song from back in the day that involved a lot of mumbling? Is it what I'm doing right now in this building? Is it what people in your life do? Yes, but not this one. For this work, we talk about work being, is work is when we are changing energy in a system. So for us, we always want to think about work as being changing the energy of a system. Some of you might say, all right, all right, so then what the heck is energy? Well, energy, very easily defined, um, it's the ability to do work. Okay, so just energy's ability to work. But then what's work again? Well, work obviously is a change in energy. But what's energy? It's the ability to do work. But what's work? It's a change in energy. But what's energy? It's the ability to do work. But what's work? It's a change in energy. But what's energy? It's the ability to do work. But what's, what's work? It's a change in energy. You see, we get sort of stuck there in a cyclic pattern. This repeats forever. That's how interrelated they are. They are so closely related. For us, though, when we think about work, I want to think about changing the energy of the system or, or what we're doing. So let's imagine a pretty easy example. You know, if I had a block on the ground and let's say we were going to push it, right? Now, if I was to move that block in such a way that um, I was making it from rest to moving, I am actually going to be adding energy into that system, okay? So I'm going to add energy to that system. And adding energy we always define as positive work being done. If I'm adding energy to the system, Okay, so I'm, I'm managing the system, I'm doing positive work. And you can think about as a delta, it's a positive change, right? But what if, uh, after I'm done pushing it, I, I release the block and it slows down. Now, if it's slowing down, that means that block is now losing energy. So if energy is being removed from the system or it's going out of the system, we talk about that being negative work. Now, can I do negative work? Sure, if the box is coming at me and I push against it, right? But more commonly, most likely that would probably be a frictional effect, right? Because friction would remove energy. But what if we had an object that was actually moving at a constant rate? If you have an object moving at a constant rate, right? What does that mean? It's not, not accelerating, right? So because it's not accelerating, that means I'm adding energy into the system. Friction, most likely, is removing energy from the system, and those two things are happening at the same rate. And because they're actually happening at the same rate, we get constant motion. Very, very important. Uh, and, you know, we can see in our equations that we talk about work being FD. And remember that uh, the force has to be in the same uh, plane, if you will, as the displacement. So, you know, if, if we talk about a rope pulling this, some sort of tension force pulling this, the tension would do work if this block were to displace. But uh, if we were to think about, you know, we would have a normal force acting on this, that normal force would not be doing work because it's only displacing horizontally. So it's not really, you know, what we're going to do. Now, doing a work change in energy uh, is typically what we do if we have an object that it has something external acting on it, some external stimulus uh, that it is acting on it. But what happens if we don't have anything external? We're just sort of dealing with, with our system. Uh, this is where we get to one of the most more foundational things that's super important for us, the conservation of energy. 
it's like a law or something. Uh, and this, you know, for me, always brings up childhood. E-I-E-I-F, cause in the beginning it's the initial energy, and then in the end it's the final. Funny, right? Okay! So what are we talking about here, right? We have the initial energy in our system, we have the final energy in our system, and we can't be losing energy if our system is large enough. So if our system is the universe, for instance, we're not gaining or losing energy uh, in the universe. Now, universe, that's actually probably too big of a system normally for a lot of our problems. Our problems are normally like the objects, the ground, and the earth is what we include for our systems. I don't know, that's such a... Excuse me why I deal with that, the wine. And we're back. The lovely Miss Quinn, you know, needs some love and attention sometime. To energy. We got conservation of energy. So if my system is big and it's all the things, I'm not going to lose it. Now, if I have one singular object, that object is going to gain and lose energy to other objects around it. Now, what, what are many of the forms of energy we can have? You can see by our equations right here, right? We could have uh, K, right, which is kinetic energy right? Symbol K, also known as energy of motion. So if something is moving, right, doesn't matter how it's moving, up, down, left, to right, we would define it as having kinetic energy. Uh, we could uh, have, um, geez, gravitational uh, potential energy, and the symbol for this is UG, and that is anything above uh, sort of a base level that's set by us. Typically, the ground is what we use, right? Anything above that level uh, would have gravitational potential energy, right? You can see the equation there um, dictated by, by, you know, mass, obviously. So more mass of things would have more potential uh, gravitational potential energy, right? Uh, and then uh, last one we had uh, was we talked a bit about springs, right, or elastic uh, potential energy. And this is U-S, right? Uh, and that's dictated by, you know, a, a spring being stretched, uh, making sure that those springs are, in fact, hookian, which that's a, that's a fun little side topic. Now, the other thing we, we have dealt with when we're, we're doing this is that lovely thing, uh, you know, internal energy or that thing called heat, and we, the symbol we typically use is Q. Now, for this, these three uh, fall under a subcategory of something that we call mechanical Jeez, energy. So you'll see that sometimes, uh, you know, they'll ask a question about like mechanical energy being conserved, and you notice that heat is not a form of mechanical energy. So be careful with that in terms of reading and solving the problems. Now, the way we use this lovely little EIEIF is we gotta sort of identify the problem, identify the scenario, and see, you know, what, what energy would exist at the different spots. So let's just do a, a very simple example. So if I had, you know, something like some sort of curved track, maybe, right, and that it's getting to the ground, and let's say, um, you know, it's, it's uh, some sort of block that starts up here, and it's gonna slide, and it's gonna get all the way down here. And let's say that this is actually a rough slide, to make this a little bit harder. Um, you know, so because it's starting above the ground at rest, we would say up here it'd be gravitational potential energy. And then when it gets down here, right, it should be moving here, so we would say this has to be kinetic energy. But because it's also a rough surface, we're also actually going to have heat now that is generated as well. So I'm going to get kinetic energy and heat. Now, if I wanted to solve this, because if my system is more than just a block, if my system is the block and the ramp and the world, if I was going to set this up to solve this, E-I-E-I-F, because in the beginning it's all gravitational potential, and then it becomes kinetic plus heat. And I can use that to solve depending on what they're asking me to do. Are they asking me for the height of the ramp? Are they asking me for the speed at the bottom of the ramp? It really depends on, on the given, given scenario. Now, one of the reasons we really, really like energy and one of the reasons that we find it to be so advantageous to understand and use is before this point, we would have to do a mixture of dynamics and kinematics simultaneously to get to the same answer. So to sort of, you know, express the importance of this, you know, if I had something like a ramp and I have a block at the top of the ramp, right? If I was going to do this uh, in old way, what I'd 
probably first do, right, is uh, the first thing I would do with this is I would uh, identify all the forces and I would do some Fnet stuff. And then I would have to use that to determine the acceleration. Then after I found the acceleration, I would head and I would use my charts to try to find the speed at the bottom of the ramp. Okay. Now, if there's friction on this, right, that puts a wrinkle in this F net and this A. It makes it a little bit more challenging, a little bit more difficult. But now with this, so instead of doing all this, and you can imagine how much work this ends up being, instead, I can do E, I, E, I, F, and that's it. I'm doing everything simultaneously. I'm doing everything at once. What if there's friction? I can also still do this all at once because for a scenario like this, right, if it's no friction, it's just UG equals K. And I can very easily solve knowing the height of the ramp. This is the huge advantage for us using energy. Let's talk for another minute about systems. And one of uh, the best examples I think is actually a bow and arrow. So let's think about having just a bow first and that's, not a great drawing of a bow, but like, you know, it could be worse, I guess. Uh, and then let's imagine that I just sort of have my arrows separate for a minute, right? And then you can imagine the next scenario where I have my bow, jeez, is stretched with the arrow. And then my final scenario uh, where my bow is back to what it was originally. And in the end, I have my arrow, and now my arrow would be moving this way. So if we try to identify this, um, you know, in the beginning, this initial system, it actually doesn't have any energy. It's just sort of just chilling there. And what happens is, in order to get from this scenario to this scenario, there has to be work that is done because I have to add energy into the system. That's the only way that would work. Right, if we get there. And now once that energy is added into the system, we should get conservation of energy between the next two scenarios. Okay? If our system is all of the things. If our system's everything, we're gonna get conservation of energy. But what if it wasn't? So let's think about just the bow for a minute. Let's think about what what's the bow doing? So, you know, we have these scenario one, two, and three, and let's sort of think about, you know, what's up with the bow? So in that first scenario, Right, the bow is just sort of hanging out, no big deal. And as it goes from one to two, the bow is going to gain energy, right? Because something is doing work, stretching the bow back, adding energy into the bow. But with the bow, as we then go from scenario two to scenario three, the bow is now actually losing energy, right? Because the bow was stretched, storing potential energy, and then in the end, it's, it's sort of back to normal. So now it lost energy. So if you think about just the bow, the bow is actually gaining energy in the first, and then it's actually losing energy in the second. If we were to think about just our arrow here. Now, as we go from scenario one to scenario two, the arrow is just sort of chilling, right? Like nothing really going on with the arrow. But as we go from scenario two to scenario three, the arrow is actually gaining energy. Because the arrow, is, it went from not moving to moving, right? So as we see here, and if we sort of think about this, the bow lost energy, but we can't really ever lose energy. So where is it actually going? The arrow. Now, why do I bring up this question? Why is this so important? This is why systems and what system you're looking at ends up being so important for energy. If we're talking about all the stuff ever, EIEIF, no big deal, move on with our lives. But if we're talking about one singular object and there are external things acting on it, we're going to have to be very, very careful with our definitions. The bow here is gaining and then losing energy. Uh, the arrow is, is just gaining energy. Important things, uh, and you know, energy is a wide topic that covers many, many things, but it's a great overview. So uh, smash that like and subscribe. Is it here? Is it here? I still don't know! And until next time, thanks for watching.